Uh, okay, I think we're going to start now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are honored to host today uh, Professor Bedros Dermatosian at the Vanir Jerusalem Institute. Professor Dermatosian has been an assistant professor of modern Middle East history at the University of Nebraska Lincoln since 2010. He was born and raised in Jerusalem, and he's a graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he began his graduate studies in the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, he later on completed his PhD in Middle East history at the, at the Columbia University. He has also taught in MIT, at MIT and the University of Chicago. He has published extensively, and his latest book, Shattered Dreams of Revolution, From Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire, won the 2015 Sona Aronian Book Prize for Armenian Studies and Research. Please. Thank you, Mehdi, for that wonderful presentation. Can you hear me in the back? Or I should try? No? no? Can we? One? Again? Can you hear me in the back? Better. Better? OK. As Erev Tov, I want to thank Mahom Van Lier for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank my friend Stefan Ihrig, Erdal Kainar and Dr. Ido Litmanovic, who manages the development of the development of the Yama Tichon. I want to thank you to the Medi, Nachmiya Zbaru, who manages the Turkish Forum. אז ההרצאה תהיה באנגלית, אם יש לכם איזה שאלות, אתם יכולים לשאול את זה באנגלית או עברית גם. So, my topic usually, the research topic usually deals with the Young Turk Revolution from the perspective of non-dominant group. I try to examine the way in which the non-dominant groups, uh, non-dominant groups reacted to and 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 reacted to the Young Turk Revolution and internalized the Young Turk Revolution in their uh, in their daily lives and in their in their commun community structures. But today I'm going to do to, to talk about the marginalized aspect of the Young Turk Revolution and that is the political culture of the Young Turk Revolution, which has been marginalized and and uh, people have more concentrated on the perspective of, from the perspective of political aspect of the Young Turk Revolution. So before I start the talk, I'm going to discuss the layout of my talk. Okay. So uh, this would be the outline of the uh, of the talk. In the beginning, I will provide an introduction. Oh. In the beginning, I would provide an introduction about the topic itself, and then we're going to visit the different provinces in the Ottoman Empire and discuss the revolutionary festivities in the provinces and to, to see how different communities reacted to the revolution. Afterwards, I'm going to discuss three individuals who exempl exemplified the revolution and they became national heroes, trans trans transcending different political and ethnic boundaries. And then the second part of the, of the, uh, of the presentation is more important. It would, ana it would be an analysis of the revolution ritual rituals based on three important concepts, rit rituals, space, symbolism, and, and, uh, and language. And after that, I won't conclude. So the talk would be about 45 minutes, so bear with me, please. On July 1908, a group of disgruntled Ottoman military officers and members of the Committee of Union and Progress, hence the CUP, the dominant party of the Young Turk movement, mounted a successful revolution against the despotic regime of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, which resulted in the restoration of the constitution 
and the opening of the parliament, both of which were suspended 30 years prior. What became to be known as the Young Turk Revolution brought euphoria and optimism to the multi-ethnic, multi-religious populations of the Ottoman Empire. An important understudied aspect of the revolution has been its political culture. So my talk today will discuss the political culture of the Young Turk Revolution by analyzing three important themes, space, symbolism, and language. Now I'll start. On July 25th, 1908, the population of the Ottoman capital, Istanbul, began rejoicing at the reinstatement of the constitution. Thousands of traders, industrialists, and other professionals of all the confessions, Muslims, Greeks, Armenians, and Jews participated in the procession. One of the most important one of the most important events that took place in Istanbul was the mass that was held on the 13th of August, 1908, in Pera's Holy Trinity Armenian Church, Sur Piero Tutun Church, at Balak Pazar. So this is basically the Balak Pazar, the entrance to the Sur Piero Tutun Church, and the, these are the masses celebrating the revolutions. And as you can see in a, in a second picture, the way in which the entrance to the road that leads to the church is decorated with different decorations and you can see also it's not it's not clear here but you can see mottos of the revolution uh, i think this one reads the uh, long live the constitution five days before the event an announcement was made in local armenian press and invitations were sent to the offic ottoman officials and dignitaries the streets as you saw leading to the armenian church were decorated with flags with flags, Ottoman officials, dignitaries, and representatives of all religious denominations attended the ceremony, including the Sheikh al Islam. The ceremony was officiated by the local tenants of the Armenian Patriarchate, uh, Bishop Yerishe Turyan, who gave a patriotic speech. The, cer the ceremony then proceeded to the Taksim Square. It's, it's within the few range from the, uh, uh, from the church. Taksim Square Garden, where the celebration reached their peak, representatives of various ethnic groups gave, gave enthusiastic speeches, and thousands of people gathered in the garden to celebrate, and I quote, Turkish-Armenian Brotherhood. The jubilation and revolution festivities that took place in Istanbul are testimony to the post-revolutionary euphoria that descended upon the different cities and ethnic groups of the empire. They also mark the beginning of the public sphere that emerged from the revolution. That public sphere employed both local print culture and local ritual in a way that allowed the new nations, varied ethnic and religious groups, to participate in and incrementally define the culture of the new Ottoman nation. This process was not always a cooperative one. The new public sphere became the contested terrain in which ethnic groups struggled and competed to create a, a national political culture. The celebration and festivities of the successful revolution inaugurated a new era and announced the demise of the ancien regime. This required the adoption of new categories of social and political definitions, new symbols, and an attempt to adopt consensus among all the ethnic groups. As part of this process, there was an attempt to create a civic religion that would provide social solidarity for the ethnic groups and emphasize <coughs> oneness rather than distinction. What were the post-revolutionary celebrations about? Who participated in these celebrations? What was the anatomy of these celebrations? These are some of the questions I'm going to answer in the course of this talk. Parades and public ceremonies in post-revolutionary periods are an extremely important aspect of cultural history, which asserts the priority of symbol making, language deployment, discourse construction, and perception of these symbols. The newspapers of the Ottoman Empire's different ethnic groups provide a rich source of data regarding celebrations in the immediate post-revolutionary period. Celebrations, parades, and festivities of the revolution took place 
in the public sphere and required both participants and audience. The newspaper's account revealed that these events involved negotiations between the ruler and the ruled, as well as uh, participants, as participants and audiences. Analysis of these events reveals a strong collective ex expression of solidarity with the new regime, although this solidarity, although it was a solidarity that highlighted di diversity and thus contradicted the revolutionary ideal. In addition, by printing these accounts in newspapers, the ethnic groups contributed to a greatly enlarged se sense of audience. It is important to note here that the two major Ottoman newspapers, Young Turks newspapers, the Ikdam and Tanin, did not publish any of these events in their uh, newspapers. Sharing information about the celebration of revolution facilitated the emergence of common national, national language of ritual activity among the ethnic groups, and these public rituals became the sphere in which different ethnic groups interacted. In addition to legitimizing the emerging of new regime and delegitimizing de 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 the ancien regime, rituals facilitated popular solidarity where consensus was absent. In the midst of political shifts, rituals played a crucial role in supporting the new institutional order. In fact, as French historian Mona Azouf observed in her study of the French Revolution, revolutionary festivities, festivals prosper as long as patriotism is in danger, and it evanesces or goes away once patriotism is reassured. In other words, the extensive participation of the non-dominant groups in the revolutionary festivities aimed at demonstrating their loyalty, their loyalty to the new regime. Now we're going to go to different provinces and see how the different provinces reacted or celebrated the revolution. As news about the proclamation of constitution spread to the province, spread to the provinces, similar celebrations uh, began to spring up outside Istanbul. As soon as freedom was declared, the people of Adana and Mersin began decorating all the streets and houses, houses. Immediately, the inhabitants began visiting each other, and masses were held in honor of the Sultan and the Ottoman nation. On August 2, 1908, a 300-person delegation of notables and dignitaries arrived from Adana to Mersin on a train decorated with the royal, royal coat of arms and the imperial monogram. The train was received by a huge crowd hailing freedom and the constitution. The crowd, accompanied by live music, then moved to the government building where they were received by the Mutasarref and many officers. A reception held by the Committee of Union and Progress in Mersin concluded the event. Immediately afterwards, the crowd moved to the municipal garden which, where it was received by the governor and the provincial, provincial Functionaries, and this is a very rare image. By the way, the, the images that I use in these uh, in these uh, in, in demonstrating the festivities and the rituals of the revolution is very difficult to find. So I had to dig and find many of these uh, images. And this is a very striking image. It's the it's, it's the uh, it's uh, it's the oath that the soldiers are taking in Adana for. Uh, preserving the constitution. And it is odd enough that the Armenians were also happy about the revolution and the festivities. And less than in eight months, the, uh, the revolution, the counter revolution was take, going to take place. And then the Adana massacres were going to proceed. Such provincial celebrations were, however, not universally immediate. In Van, for example, the telegram of the imperial order on the implementa implementation of the Ottoman constitution arrived on the 25th of July. The governor of the province, Ali Riza, refused to inform the people about the telegram out of loyalty to the Sultan. It was not until the 11th and the 12th of, of August that he implemented these orders and released the prisoners. Most of them were Armenians, actually. Celebrations for the constitution began immediately afterwards. Festivities, festivities were held on, well, held on August 14th, 15th, and 16th and continued on into September. 
On September the 6th, the Armenian Church of Surp Asfadzadzi in St. Mary held mass commemorating the Armenian Turkish martyrs. A huge crowd of Armenians and Turks headed to the Armenian Church with at least 2,000 people. The entrance of the church was de decorated with flags, as was a large stage in front of the church, which was draped in red, black, and white flags symbolizing blood, mourning, and freedom. A requiem service held after the mass by the deputy of the patriarch and was attended by the Ottoman officers, officers and other government officials. Afterward, the crowd moved to the Armenian cemetery where the attendants put wreaths on the tombs of the Armenian martyrs. The stage was built in the cemetery for a commemorative event attended by dozen Ottoman officers as well as other Turkish and Armenian dignitaries. A long series of speeches was delivered exalting the names of Niazi and Enver Bey, the heroes of the revolution. In Izmir, Smyrna, the news of the proclamation of the constitu constitution was received with great joy and enthusiasm. Bands, was bands were stationed all over the decorated town playing the Hamidiye march, the Marseillaise, and the British and Hellenic anthems. The Jewish Youth Association held a huge celebration. The procession went on for five hours with about 2,000 Jews walking to, towards the government palace. Ottoman dignitaries marched with, with them and they were all shouting, long live the Sultan, long live the fatherland, and long live the liberty. The procession was headed by a large carriage decorated with flowers that carried six young girls who were dressed as angels with, while weaving Ottoman flags and scarves dyed in the national colors. Later, around 500 young Jews joined the procession, carrying red and white scarves, the emblem of the Jewish-Turkish committee, and canes with flags and lamps on the edges of the canes. Christian and Muslims also joined the procession. The uh, procession moved to the governor's palace, chanting, long live the nation, long live the sultan, before touring all the neighborhoods of the city. Of course, it is very difficult to find exactly a picture or an image of that celebration, but I found something similar to it, and that's the celebration, Armenian celebration from, uh, Armenian, Armenian celebration in uh, festivities in Erzurum. And as you can see, there are similar ways of the procession taking place, and here you can see a woman uh, wearing white. Why do you think white, white is important? What? Raise your voice. <laughs> Oh, sorry, white, she's standing on a carriage. There are children here surrounded the carriage. So white is, is, is the beginning of the new era. It represents the new era. It represents justice, too, and loyalty, too. So these types of celebrations are taking place all over the country, all over the Ottoman Empire. Now, coming back to Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, people were not aware of the restatement of the Constitution until two weeks after its pro promulgation. On the 6th of August, the crier announced that everyone from all the ethnic groups should gather in front of the Kishla military barrack on Saturday, the 8th of August, at 6 p.m., when the imperial decree, the Firman, was to be read. The Kishla, all of you know today, where is the Kishla? It's the police station in the, near the Armenian quarter. Uh, the, the announcement was also published in the local newspaper streets, buildings and vehicles were decorated with branches, festoons, and flags, and at night the city was illuminated. Celebrations began on Friday evening. On Saturday, thousands gathered from all corners in the vast square of the Kishla, adjoining David's Tower, to listen to the decree that was read by the governor, Ali Ekram Bey. Celebrations in Jerusalem were also marked by unity in diversity. Part of the St. James Brotherhood and about 200 other Armenian community members formed a group in front of the Armenian quarter, where they were immediately received by a military band. They then moved towards the square of Kishla, where they joined the Jewish and Greek groups. In the evening, the square of the Kishla was filled, filled with thousands of people. A stage was centered, erected for the del delivery of the speech, speeches. Governor Ali Ekram Bey gave a speech and greeted the public with, long live the Sultan before sending the, reading the edict. Meanwhile, a military band played the Hamidiye march, 
The Greeks numbering 2,000 also joined with music, flags, and speeches. Six or seven government officials gave speeches. Later, the group moved to the municipal garden. Municipal garden. The Armenians who had gathered in front of their quarters arrived to Jaffa Gate Square, where there were about 6,000 people waiting. In front of the city gate, the municipality erected a huge arc and decorated with flags, flowers, and big banners, which read, long live the Sultan, long live the army, long live the freedom, freedom, equality, and fraternity. Similar small flags were carried by the Pasha, the commander of the army, and all the officials and people of the government. Here the crowd was composed of Jews, Greeks, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Every, everyone gathered in that space, forming an immense ocean of people. The speeches were given from the balcony of the Postal Telegram Bureau. After the festivities, some 40,000 Muslim Jews and Christians gathered in front of the army palace where the Pasha of the army welcomed them before distributing lemonade, coffee, and cigarettes. And the celebration of Jerusalem continued for 10 to 15 days. So we just got uh, an idea as to how the different ethnic groups are celebrating the festivities. I can go more, bring in more exam um, example from Damascus, Beirut, and many other cities. But I'm going to move on now to discuss the, uh, discuss the, three, the individuals who exempl exemplify the revolution. And it's a, it's a very important aspect of understanding how individuals transcend ethnic and political boundary to become heroes celebrated not only by Armenian or Turks or Arabs, but, for, but with, uh, for everyone. In addition to the role of these ceremonies in the provinces, the role of revolutionary heroes is vital to the construction of the revolution rituals. A revolution ritual cannot be imagined without the glorification of individual heroes who play an important role within post-revolutionary societies. These people became the cult figures that connect diverse groups in an attempt to create a new, overarching identity. Examining these heroes elucidates how ethnic groups saw themselves being imagined, integrated into a larger post-revolutionary society by their hero. In the case of the Ottomans, the preeminent heroes of the Young Turks Revolution, Young Turk Revolution, were Niazi and Anwar Bey. Even Armenians used to praise Niazi and Anwar Bey. And Anwar Bey, later, in a few years, was going to become one of the key architects of the Armenian genocide. In the case of non-dominant ethnic groups, they too venerated heroes that represented their own suppressed communities. Most of these heroes were either in exile or in jail. As the revolution ended, so their release and return back to the capital was a significant component of public rituals in post-revolutionary manifestation of the public sphere. By symbolizing the demise of the ancient regime and the beginning of the new era, these figures transcended their ethnicity to become Ottoman national heroes. Thus, their return was the completion of the victorious act of the revolution. The rituals that mark these moments of reintegration required a physical manifestation of the hero in front of the public. The manifestation was multi-local in that it moved from one province to another before arriving to its final destination, that's Istanbul, Constantinople. This aspect of the ritual was particularly important since the hero's reception by the people of different provinces and from different ethnic backgrounds represented the consecration the consecration of the new era. Much has been written about Niazi and Anver. They were venerated by all the Ottoman publics and people. The heroes of the young church, much less, however, has been written from the perspective of the Armenians, Arabs, and Jews. For these groups, there were three important figures who became national heroes and consecrated the beginning of a new era. These were Bishop Ismirilian, Fuad Pasha, and Prince Sabahiddin. I'll start with Patriarch Matthias Ismirilian. Armenian Patriarch Matthias Ismirilian, the Patriarch of Constantinople between the years 1894 to 19, 1896, was deposed 
and banished to Jerusalem by Sultan Abdul Hamid II on the 26th of August 1896 for boldly denouncing the Hamidian massacres of 1896. For 12 years, he stayed in the Armenian Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem, here in the Armenian Quarter. When news of the proclamation arrived in Jerusalem, the governor of Jerusalem, Ali Ekrem Bey, initially refused to declare the reinstatement of the constitution and prevented Bishop Ismailian from traveling. However, after a few days, freedom was declared and Jerusalem and Ismailian was allowed to return to Istanbul. <coughs> after leaving Jerusalem, Ismailian's entourage traveled to Jaffa, taking the boat from there, accompanied by CUP branch members from Jerusalem who gave him a wreath to be placed on the Armenian cemetery in Shishli in Istanbul in the memory of the Armenian martyrs. In Jaffa, where the city was decorated with flags in his honor, Ismailian was received by local Arabs and military band. From there, the entourage moved to Beirut, where it was received by local Turks and Arabs. The company then headed to Izmir, Smyrna. On Monday, August 24, four ferries, accompanied by musicians, left the Bay of Izmir displaying the flags that read, Long live Izmirlian, long live the Constitution, and long live the freedom. The Armenian National Administration of Izmir, Armenian clergy, and a delegation of the CUP were abroad one of these f ferries, which was named Osmaniye. Around 4 p.m. that day, Izmirlian's ship arrived when the crowd saw Ismailian began singing a song in Armenian specially composed for him with the title, The Supreme Hero of Freedom, Eternally Long Live Ismailian. From the ship, Ismailian himself gave an enthusiastic speech in reply. At the Bay of Izmir, there was a carriage waiting for Ismailian. About 40 other carriages joined the procession along with the band. The people standing by, by there were shouting, Long live the soldier, long live the army and long live Ismailian. Armenian medals were printed and distributed as the procession came in from the bay. The medal display an effigy of Ismailian on the one side and the words long live the constitution in Armenian and long live the freedom <coughs> uh, uh, in Ottoman Turkish. On the other, including a reference to the day of the revolution, July 11, 1908, which is 24, the procession, then the procession moved towards the Armenian quarter of Izmir, which was decorated uh, for the occasion before traveling to the Armenian church of Sir Stepanos, St. Stephen's, St. Stephen's. So basically these are the effigies. It's very difficult to find, find things like this. So on this section here, it's written in Armenian, Getse Sahmana Tuchuna. Uh, here it's written uh, Matios Ismirian, and again Armenian, uh, Armenian, Armenian words here. So imagine this is the way in which also the revolution has been, you know, the way in which Ismirian became a national hero for all the Armenians and the Ottomans in general. Descending from the carriage and entering the church, Ismirian moved down the aisle under a canopy on Povani, carried by six young people, three of whom were Ottoman generals. The church was full of both Armenians and Turks, and Ismailian gave a sermon in which he emphasized unity, saying, freedom is a necessary for a man as breathing air during the despotic period. The people during the sorry, sorry, during the despotic period, the people were deprived of this goodness. But now let us be thankful to God because with divine intervention, he gave it to us. Let us know the value of this goodness and let us show certainly that we are worthy of it. Let us live in harmony with all our compatriots. Let us specially value the sacrifices carried by our Turkish compatriots and the provi providential activity of the strong Hearted Ottoman army. End quote. Next day, Ismailian traveled to Istanbul by a ship. About 24 ferries came out of the port of Galata to receive him. When the ship approached the port, there were about 1,000 Armenians 
and Turks writing, waiting for him. The crowd extended from the Tophane to the bridge from Galata to the Armenian Patriarch in Kumkapu. The procession moved to the main Armenian church and an important ceremony took place there in the, Ar uh, in the Armenian cemetery of Shishli in the memory of the martyrs who fell for the Armenian cause and cause of freedom, for the cause of freedom. The other important figure is Fuat Pasha. Fuat Pasha was a Circassian born in Egypt and was the commander, was a commander during the Turkey Russo's Turkish War of 1877-78. He was nicknamed Deli because Deli means crazy in Turkish for his courageous act. And he was the commander of the Ottoman troops troop during the Battle of Elena, during which he, he, he which the Ottoman troops were defeated in Russia. So consequentially, consequentially he was awarded uh, the title of uh, Mushir by the Marshal, by the uh, Sultan. But in 1902, he was accused of plotting against the Sultan and was banished to Damascus. So when the news of the revolution arrives to Damascus, the soldiers there go to the prison and by force take him out and, and celebrate him and venerate him as a national hero. While leaving the mosque, he was greeted by thousands of people who gathered around him that evening, and the CUP held a ceremony in the Daftar Dar Garden that was attended by spiritual readers, military civil officers, and a crowd of 50,000 people. A similar celebration, reception, similar reception was given to Fuad Pasha in Beirut, and afterwards Fuad Pasha arrived in Istanbul, uh, and uh, the same way that uh, uh, the same way that uh, Ismailan arrived in Istanbul with great jubilation and uh, on a ship that was called Sakhalin. This is Istanbul, and this is this, this is uh, uh, Fuad Pasha, and he is really greeted in a very festive manner by the uh, by all the uh, uh, Ottoman nations. Last but not least is Prince Sabahadi. For all, all the ethnic groups, but especially for Armenians, Prince Sabah Din was the most important personality of the Young Turks. This was mainly because of his vision that administrative decentralization was the only panacea for the ongoing ethnic tensions that were jeopardizing the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Before his arrival, Sabah Din stopped in Izmir where he was received by the Armenians the Armenian Revolution Federation, and the CUP in Kramer Palace. In Istanbul, Turks and Armenians began making preparations for the, for the reception of Prince Sabahaddin days before his arrival on the 2nd of September, 1908. The, the, the prince arrived bringing with him the relics of his father, Mahmoud Damat Pasha. A detailed program for his reception had been pre uh, prepared. <laughs> And uh, the official delegation, there were official delegations on the different ferries and the boats that went out to the sea in order to receive, uh, to receive Prince Sabahaddin. So basically, this is the uh, Prince, Princesa Maria on which Sabahaddin came. And uh, this is the arrival of Sabahaddin with the, uh, with, with the uh, arrival of Sabahaddin with, with his father's relic. And if you ask me, I would tell you that this was the biggest celebration of the festivities of the revolution that from all the ethnic groups praising Sabah Din's political activity and his, uh, and his readiness to come back to be part of the political system within the empire. Now, what are we going to do now is to analyze. Until now, it was a descriptive, uh, it was descriptive uh, demonstration of the festivities in the different uh, Ottoman provinces and cities. And you saw how there were a lot of commonalities between the different groups, uh, a lot of symbolism, a lot of language, uh, a deployment of uh, um, uh, languages and symbolism. But now we're going to start discussing the analysis of the revolution rituals, space symbolism, and language. Although some of the revolutionary festivities were spontaneous, they all entailed a, cert entailed a certain level of organization and planning. Finding an appropriate public space for the celebration was an important aspect of the celebration process. In this space, public enjoyment must be able to manifest recurrently without any obstacle or impediments. 
In addition, this space would be the meeting place for all Ottoman citizens, regardless of their ethnic background, who had one thing in common that day, celebration of freedom and the constitution. Thus, the celebration's first requirement was the open air. Open air. The biggest advantage that an open air space had was that it was a space without memories, allowing it to symbolize entry into the new era. In particular, three important spaces were used for, uh, used for the revolutionary festivities and rituals, gardens, cemeteries, and religious edifices, buildings. In some cases, these three types of spaces were used consecutively and therefore contradicted the ideals, ideal rituals of the revolution celebration. We'll start with gardens. Gardens and open spaces provide the ideal space for revolutionary festivities. They contain three major prerequisites for this type of celebration. First, they were open air with no interruption or obstacles. Second, they were spaces without memories. And finally, they were natural places that symbolized, symbolized entry into the new order. Thus, they received as they served as ideal places for creating new memories. These new memories were consecrated by the participation of the different ethnic groups. The Taksim Garden in Istanbul, the Municipal Garden in Adana, Hamidian Garden in Beirut, the Municipal Garden in Jerusalem were all spaces in which revolutionary festivities reached their apex. Of course, it is very difficult to, dig, to, to, to get pictures of these festivities. This, is, this, is, this one is the Jerusalem Garden, uh, picture of Jerusalem Garden. This is the uh, manifestation, the Taksim Garden. You see, Jerusalem is important, but again, we have uh, very difficult access to these pictures. Thousands poured into these gardens and open spaces, cre creating a sea of people. Interestingly, most of these gardens and open spaces were not decorated. Were not decorated. This is because they lacked any memories. Decorations were necessary only in places where memory was evident, where they played the role of transforming the old place into a new one. In the case of the gardens, nature was the decorator. In most cases, although they ended in gardens, revolutionary festivities began in churches, external sections of mosques and synagogues, and municipal buildings. Example of these are the festivities that took place in, <coughs> in Istanbul, Adana, and Jerusalem. Although such physical entities in which memories were omnipotent contradicted the ideal celebration of revolution, they never, nevertheless served as a source of legitimacy. The revolutionary festivities needed that legitimacy in order to create a new memory. Churches were the major centers of the revolutionary festivities. Housing a multiplicity of obstacles, as well as strong presence of memory, they contradicted the ideal of revolutionary celebrations. The interior space of the church, of the Armenian churches, had lost all meanings because, and I quote, the pillars were an obstruction of the, to the view. The vault spread its false sky over the celebrant. The architecture seems to rival the, the ceremony. The church was badly planned in convenient theater, an artistic illusion that did not even achieve its object." End quote. Pera's Armenian church, Pera's Armenian church of Holy Trinity, the Superior to Tune, at Balak Pazari, the Armenian Church of St. Mary in Van, the Armenian Church of St. Stephanos in Izmir, and the Armenian Church of Beirut all served as important spaces for the revolutionary festivities. However, these churches had to be converted and transformed into new space spaces in order to perform that function. This transformation was achieved through use of decorations aimed at creating a new quote-unquote, secular space that was accessible to all ethnic groups regardless of their religious backgrounds. Decorations of churches also aimed at covering old memories. Though they were unable to entirely erase the echoes of the past, 
For example, during the festivities, all the entrances of, and the streets leading to the churches were decorated with Ottoman flags and banners upon which the revolution slogans were written in different languages. Again, this is Church of Holy Trinity in Istiklal Jadesa. This is the Church of Sub Stephanos in, Baza, in, in Izmir. And again, the Holy Trinity Armenian Church. And you can see the decorations all over the place, the place to the entrance to the to the street, to the church, of the street and the church. And now it's more eligible that it's written on the top, Sahmana Chuchun, or, or otherwise Constitution. Interestingly, as the same could not be said, be said about the mosques and the synagogues, because I haven't found a case that revolution celebrations took place within a mosque or within a synagogue. Most of the time, it's the interior section of these churches, of uh, these synagogues and mosques that, mosques that the celebration took place. Cemeteries were important spaces for one particular dimension of revolution rituals, mourning and requiem services. These services paid tribute to those who fell for the cause. In the spatial grammar of post-revolution celebrations, cemeteries are a middle ground between religious space and gardens, a semi natural open space, gardens devoid of obstacles and, or interruptions. They have more in common with gardens than with churches. Despite the lack of pillars to obstruct one's view, however, cemeteries still hold a great deal of literally buried memories. Moreover, the memory housed in the cemeteries had more significance for all the ethnic groups than the memory contained in religious edifices. This memory, after all, related directly to the people of many backgrounds who sacrificed their lives for the realization of the new era, whether that's the constitution or the revolution. The Armenian National Cemetery of Shishli, the Armenian cemeteries of Erzinjan, Ordu, and Van all serve this purpose. In Van, for example, requiem service took place in the, in the church of Surp Asfadzatin, St. Mary, on September 6. 1908, after the service, the crowd moved to the cemetery where people put wreaths on the tomb of Armenian martyrs. The stage was built in the cemetery for a commemorative event. A dozen Ottoman generals and numerous Turkish and Armenian dignitaries, among them the local leaders of the Armenian Revolution Federation, attended the ceremonies. Likewise, when, likewise, when Bishop Izmirlian arrived in Istanbul on August 25, an important cemetery, a mortar ceremony took place in the Armenian National Cemetery for, of Shishli. Bishop Ismailian, Turkish dignitaries, and a huge crowd moved to the cemetery. A bailiff was heading the procession, carrying an Ottoman flag and a wreath that the CUP of Jerusalem had given Bishop Ismailian in honor of the Armenian victims who fell during the Armenian massacres in Istanbul of 1896. The procession moved to the Martyrs Hill, Nadak Nerukuit in Armenian, to the with the to with, to the accompaniment 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 of of religious hymns and verses, and Bishop Ismailan put the wreath on the tomb of the martyrs before giving speech. Now we're going to analyze the symbolism and language, which is also very important in post-revolutionary societies. Governments cannot exist without rituals and symbols, because both are crucial to exercising power. Political symbols and rituals are means and ends of power itself. Governing, governing cannot take place without language, signs, and symbols that, in Lin Hans' words, convey and reaffirm the legitimacy of governing in thousand unspoken ways." End quote. To that extent, the legitimacy is the general agreement on signs and symbols. Symbolism and language during revolutionary festivities played an important role in defining the world view of the different ethnic groups of the empire. Prior to the revolution, this is important, during the Haram Hamidian period, the deployment of symbols was a state in initiative aimed at pursuing legitimacy. In the post-revolution period, however, this function was thrown into the pub public, public domain. The public spheres of the post-revolution period see symbolism from the monopoly of the state and, and the sovereign, appropriating it in an attempt to create a unified, overarching identity, which itself became counterproductive. 
Undoubtedly, the organizers of the revolution festivities consciously or unconsciously manipulated visual representations during the revolution rituals in order to have wider impact on, over the participants. Ritual is an action created by web of symbolic elements that are socially standardized and repetitive. On the other hand, actions that do not include symbolism are not rituals. Rather, they are customs and habits. It is the presence of symbolism that distinguishes rituals from other actions. Symbolism was not, however, used in isolation in these rituals. Instead, it usually was accompanied by verbal explanations in Ottoman, Turkish, Greek, Armenian, Arabic, Hebrew, and Ladino, which aimed at providing immediate clarification to the newly evolving symbolism of the revolution. In addition to clarifying the meaning of these new symbols and expressing the need for social solidarity, multilingualism also served the function of national integration. In all the revolutionary rituals, the flag, the flag became the main symbol under which people of varying ethnic groups and religious background gathered. Essentially, it became the embodiment of the Ottoman nation. Furthermore, as its meaning became the property of the public sphere, the multiple uses of the flag and other banner-like symbols became challenge, a challenge to the official monopoly of the state. And this is one important flag of the revolution during the 19, during revolution festivities. As you see, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not like the modern Turkish flag. It has few words, uh, revolutionary words, actually. Adalet is justice, Hürriyet, these are Ottoman, uh, freedom, Huvvet, brotherhood, fraternity, and Musawat, uh, equality. During the festivities of 1908, most flags were in inscribed by revolution mottos and were sold by waved, waved at demonstrations. The ethnic, ethnic press reported on the massive uses of flags in post-revolution rituals, not, 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 noting that the important role they played in Istanbul, Izmir, Adana, Trabzon, Beirut, Damascus, Van, and Jerusalem. Mementos from the period also bear witness to the phenomenon. For example, postcard, oh, for example, oh, sorry, this, this, okay. So this is another example of the flag action, actually, uh, that was uh, uh, made during the festivities. So you have the Turkish flag, and it's, it's here, it's written in, in Ottoman, Yashasin Osmanlılık, uh, long live o o Ottomanism, and here it says Yashasin Batan, long live the uh, fatherland. Uh, so uh, the... Ethnic press reported on the massive use of the flags, and I was going to show you a memento from the period. For example, for example, the on a postcard from the constitution period, almost Abdul Hamid, Abdul Hamid is shown to be in the on the upper section here, above the flags even. Okay, here in written in France, a proclamation de la constitution, and the, and the, and the thing. What's interesting about this postcard is the a few things are important. First, you have you have this symbol here. What what, what symbol do you think it is? Abdul Hamid. Abdul Hamid. No. This is this is oh no above Abdul Hamid right above Abdul Hamid. Ah, the Torah. No, this one. Yes. What is it? You think? It's a light. It's a light. And it's signifying what? A divine intervention in the whole process of giving uh, the constitution. Here you have multilingualism. Getse Sahmanatun. Dito, the I don't really need to read Greek, but it says uh, long live the uh, uh, long live the uh, uh, freedom. Yashasin Hirbiyat here, Viva la Constitution, and uh, in Ladino it's written Viva la Constitution. Okay? So these are images that we are trying to analyze. And you see the idea is to, uh, the, there's an idea of unity here. You know, on the one hand you have the army here as the, as the defender of the Ottoman nation, on the other hand you have, or maybe the navy is so the defender of the Ottoman nation.
Similarly, another postcard from the period shows the Ottoman army beneath a huge flag reading, reading Nizam, wrote in French, Justice, Adalet, Usul, Discipline, Discipline, and Vive la Constitution, La Chasse en Canon Associate. One important thing that we have to realize is the, uh, is the army as an agent, strong agent of the revolution. In the beginning, you wouldn't see the CUP members rushing in the front. CUP members rushing in the front uh, and uh, cl claiming themselves that they are the heroes of the revolution. They put the army in the front, Sultan in the, or sometimes the Sultan in the front, Sultan in the, following the army. So uh, again, the ar the, without the intervention of the army and the Sultan, the revolution wouldn't have been succeeded. Red and white flags which symbolize freedom were also common in these festivities. In addition, banners, bands, ribbons, and badges, also usually white, red, were widespread during the revolutionary celebrations. An example, an example of this is the constitution cockade bearing the inscriptions Kanuni Esasanen Yadigare, souvenir of the constitution, and you have the, you have the, uh, you have the uh, date. So these, ki these kinds of cockades usually were, were, were wear uh, usually all the ethnic groups wore them on their, on their chests, okay? Signifying the uh, Ottomanism that emerged, signifying the, uh, the new brotherhood and fraternity, and these are the colors of the revolution, it says. Uh, it's written, Kanun Esasinin, Yadiyari, souvenir of the thing, of the revolution. After the proclamation of the constitution in Istanbul, hundreds of st street peddlers, hundreds of street peddlers uh, began selling red bands with an inscription of liberty, equality, and justice on them. As you can see, these types of, you know, the cockades. You can see the cockades here. And I think this is an image of Mithat Pasha, if I'm not mistaken. It's not, it's not Abdul Hamid. Because they, the whole aim of the revolution was the reinstatement of the 1876 constitution. So if I'm not mistaken, this is Mithat Pasha. And you see the, this kid is selling here cockades, the revolutionary cockades. After the people even wore these bands on their arms, on their fezzes during the revolution festivities, in Damascus, CUP members received the procession wearing badges on their chest that read freedom, equality, and fraternity. This is, this is a type of a belt also that was, uh, that was type of a belt that was uh, endemic to the revolution, revolution festivities. See, they, they, uh, they, wore this, they wore this as a belt, and as you can see, the word musawat on, on it. So it's a transformation of the body. It's not a transformation. It's not just wearing, wearing you know, uh, cockades and wearing uh, symbols. It's, it's also meant to transform the new identity towards an Ottomanism. If the decorations, if flags were meant to exert symbolic influence on people, the aim of banners was to provide verbal explanations of the new and changing symbolism of the post-revolution period. While discussing the content of these banners, one must remember that the French, that the French revolutionary rhetoric was, revolutionary rhetoric was evident in a heavy manner in the Ottoman, uh, in, the, in the Ottoman revolution slogans. The most important of these impacts was the slogan of Liberté, Fraternité and Egalité, Hurriyat, Huvat, and Musavat, which became endemic to the post-revolutionary rituals of the different ethnic groups, even Armenians, even, uh, even Jews, even you know, Albanians, and many others. There was, however, there was an important addition to the revolutionary slogan's triad, the Ottoman concept of Adalet, justice. Adalet was not part of the trilogy that existed during the French Revolution. This new revolution slogan was translated into all the languages of the new nation. And this coin, also a coin of the, during the revolution festivities, as you can see, uh, here you have Hurriyat, Sawat here in Ottoman, Adalet, which was, as I said, a new addition to the uh, triad, and then you have Uhuwet, and then in the middle, you have symbols of the army. Along with the variants of liberty, fraternity, equality, and justice, variants of the slogan, Long Live Our King, were used extensively on the banners. The Sultan was exalted, 
of course, everyone hated the Sultan, but he was exalted on the banners because he was the one who donated the constitution to his nation, and his primacy was indica indicated over and over by the order of the word. When it came to glorifying the new era, the Sultan came the first, followed by the army and the freedom, for example, in Jaffa and Jerusalem banners, which read, long live the Sultan, long live the army, and long live the freedom. Other types of banners dealt with the theme of plurality and aimed to strengthen bones among the different ethnic groups and, religious, uh, and religions of the empire. Brotherhood, brotherhood became one of the key subjects in depicting the new nation. This is an example of, uh, of a postcard that emphasizes brotherhood. As you can see, what, what, you, what do you see in this, in, this, in this postcard? You see the army carrying carrying what? A flag, and it's written, Watanan Awu Naitihad, united for the, for the fatherland, yeah. What's unique about this picture, about this postcard? Very good. So who do you think this is? Circassians or Circassians? Circassian. Yeah. Circassian. This? Very easy. Greeks. These might be Albanians, but our poor Armenians, they, they left them in the back. You see? I don't know why. Anyways. If... Uh, So I'm just going to there, are, there is no doubt that the most of the revolution rituals were verbose. If space symbolized and slogans characterized the, sim the symbolic aspect of the revolution festivities and rituals, speeches represented the final verdict. So usually in all these revolution rituals, all of them end with speeches, because speeches provide the final verdict. Although this theme was obviously, this theme was obvious in speeches and other uh, orations during rituals, it also became manifest during the, in the banners. Uh, as with many uses of languages in the public sphere following the revolution, most of the speeches in Ottoman revolutionary rituals was multilingual. It was, it was given by different languages. And by doing so, it contradicted the whole idea, idea of unity because it was a unity based on diversity. The limitations of this enterprise were not lost on contemporary observers. For example, when Fat Dr. Faris Nimr, the editor of Al-Muqattam, delivered a speech in the Armenian church of Cairo, many of the Armenian attendees did not understand him. The Armenian daily in Istanbul, Byzantion, reported, and I quote, it is a pity that many of the attendees did not understand the high ascending phrases of that exhaustible language, meaning Arabic. Envisioning a better future entailed a discussion of the situation in the past, the speeches. Indeed, most of the revolutionary speeches contained lengthy discussions of, of the past, as in the slogans that decorated many of the banners used in the revolutionary celebrations, these speeches were influenced by the, influenced by the revolution, French Revolution rhetoric. In particular, the past was characterized by the French concept of the Ancien Regime. Even in Ottoman, even in Armenian, all the time when they referred to the previous era, they referred to it as the Ancien Regime. In fact, direct comparisons with the French Revolution were made during these speeches. For example, in Egypt, during a festivity in the Britannia Theater, Dr. Sharaf Din Bey opened the ceremony with a speech in Ottoman Turkish saying, ladies and gentlemen and dear citizens, the 24th of July is a national day of Ottomans as the 14th of July is for the French. On the 14th of July, the French demolished the fences of the Bastille prison and they destroyed the chains of despotism. And on the 24th of July, 150,000 Soldiers rose in Macedonia and demanded the return of the constitution and freedom for the nation. And because of this, the Turk, the Arab, the Armenian, the Circassian, the Greek, and the Israelite considered this day as their big day. 
Most speeches suggested that the Constitution was reinstated, reinstated by divine intervention. Thus, a religious justification of the act of revolution was necessary. In some speeches, as the number of slogans that appeared on banners throughout the new nation, verses from religion, religious covenants connected the revolutionary event to the divine project. There were quotes from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from the Quran, many other quotes. Undoubtedly, the main theme of these speeches was the concept of fraternity. Forging a new sense of unity was, after all, the main aim of these gatherings. Speakers repeatedly attempted to show how the revolution had changed inter-ethnic relationships by creating a plurality. One example of this tendency is the speech delivered by Bush, Bishop, Mushir, uh, Bishop Mushir Seropian, the prelate of Adana, to close the, the great celebration of the Garden of Taksim on the 13th of August 1908. After maintaining that despotism and injustice were the main causes of the emergence of revolutionary group, he continued saying, now, and I quote, now that despotism has ended, the injustice is gone, thanks to the blood spilled by the Armenian and Turkish martyrs, and thanks to the support of the, Armenian, or, or of, of the army, we can now become Ottomans with a fraternity gathered around a healthy state body. Let us preserve them and guard them. The same day, famous Armenian intellectual and member of the parliament, future member of parliament, Krikor Zohrab, discussed the theme of brotherhood in his Ottoman Turkish speech, which that maintained, and I quote, before we struck the covenant, before we struck the covenant of brotherhood, the Muslim martyrs and the self-sacrificing Armenians who sacrificed their lives for the homeland had already embraced each other in the tomb. So it sounds much better in Ottoman, actually. <laughs> Usually, these speeches address the issue of brotherhood and fraternity, including an important symbolic component that consecrated the covenant of brotherhood. Generally, the speeches ended with handshaking and hugging between sp sp spiritual leaders of the different ethnic groups. As a matter of fact, during the Arab Spring, in the, in the, in, in the Anglican church in Castle of Dobara in Tahrir Square, similar event takes place. You know, uh, uh, at one of the celebrations in Damascus in 1908, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Khatib al-Mughrabi made this connection particularly explicit after comparing this despotic regime with the constitutional regime and defying fanaticism, he shook the hand of the Greek Catholic bishop and shouted, long live fraternity, long live the homeland, and let every fanatic and ignorant, ignorant die. Now, conclusion, finally. I know you're tired, but. One of the most important outcomes of the Young Turk Revolution was the, was the creation of multiple competing public spheres. Different ethnic groups scattered around the empire demonstrated the reaction of non-dominant groups to the revolution. Examining symbolism, space, language, speeches, and revolutionary figures in the public rituals of 1908 revolution provides a new understanding of the festivities that were crucial aspect of creating a new Ottoman patriotism. With their ambiguous, with, with, their, with their condensation of meaning and multivocality, symbols demonstrated the existence of an ambiguous, ambiguous common symbolic culture aimed at uniting all the ethnic groups under one identity, Ottomanism. Loyalty to the nation had to transcend ethnic religious allegiances. Nonetheless, beyond the attempt at national unity, dynamics that contradicted the revolutionary ideals, including, including confessional divisions, language differences, factionalism, and assertions of separate identity were evident in these post-revolution rituals. In fact, the identity of the different ethnic groups was partly formed and revised in the public sphere through the, their participation in the revolutionary celebrations. The post-revolutionary euphoric feelings manifested through the political culture molded by the revolution are endemic to all societies that experience these, these types of pinnacle transformation. You can talk about the Arab Spring too, you know, the euphoric feeling, feelings or any other revolution, very problematic. When, once these euphoric feelings, you know, uh, diminish, then the real political lit litmus test of the polit political system is going to, going to start. In the case of the Young Turk Revolution, however, those euphoric feelings were particularly connected to the participation of subordinate groups as a legitimizing force for the revolution 
and the consecration of the new era. Their participation provided a temporary relief from the hardship they had endured during the absolutist period and an opportunity to air grievances that had been suppressed for decades. The participation of the Ottoman Empire's multi-ethnic, multi-religious population in the process also made the politics of 1908 revolution particularly paradoxical. The contradictory attempts to forge a new nation, Ottoman nation, through revolution rituals are one dimension of this paradox. The other dimension is, I can discuss, manifests it's manifest itself in the political discourse of the, uh, that preceded these, contra uh, these contradic co contradictory rituals. Of course, uh, my argument in this section is that there, the, the whole idea of revolutionary festivities and the whole idea of celebrating revolution is, had to do a lot with euphoria, but the uh, revolutionary festivities themselves were contradictory uh, celebrations, which contradicted the whole idea or the ideal of creating an equal Ottoman citizen uh, having one language and equal equal privileges. And there are many f issues that I can discuss uh, with Stefan uh, eventually during the, the uh, discussion and the period. Thank you. I was invited to comment a little bit on Bedros' uh, talk, which is a great pleasure. Thank you so much for an interesting um, talk. Um, it's basically a little bit of praise for Bedros and his research. I'm a big fan, and um, Bedros presented us from his book, which he also had on the screen a little bit. But in a way, it's a bit unfair what he did with us. What he did was basically an introduction, or rather a teaser, because his book is not called Dreams of Revolution, it's called Shattered Dreams of Revolution. And um, what Bedros does in the rest of his book is to look at, the various, at some of the various uh, um, ethnic groups of the Ottoman Empire and how they deal with the revolution, what it means for them, how conflicts, expectations and agendas are negotiated in the, years, uh, in the aftermath. What is interesting about his narrative and his research is that it's not a, theo a theological um, narrative or a theological <coughs> argument. Um, again, um, to the cover of the book, the subtitle of the book is From Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire. And Petrus stresses throughout the book that you know um, all the conflicts that follow, all the different moments that follow, nothing automatically predisposes um, the Ottoman Empire to what follows during World War I. <clears throat> um, so what is also interesting about Petrus's approach to the whole um, um, debate and uh, the whole uh, revolution <clears throat> is kind of a timeless answer, and he already alluded to it, um, to post-revolutionary euphoria. And it's a very pessimistic sounding uh, answer to this euphoria, but of course, as he already uh, stated as well, it's uh, empirically proven time and again, and you could uh, draw parallels from many different cases, but what Bedros only mentioned as a side note, actually, he's framing his book in these um, two post-revolutionary services in churches, both times in Cairo, one time, as he mentioned, uh, um, after the Young Turk Revolution, the other time um, uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring. So, of course, and Bedros plays with this in his book, the question could be now to him, what what are these lessons of the Young Turk Revolution for the Middle East? <clears throat> what indeed are the legacies of the Young Turk Revolution for the broader Middle East? And like in a, on a very simple level, of course, was it really a destructive event? Was it a positive precedent? What does it really mean? And now in his book, Petros looks at the various ethnic groups. He looks at newspapers, as he mentioned already, from the Armenian community, from uh, um, Arab newspapers, uh, Hebrew, Ladino newspapers. And it's another thing that uh, Bedros stresses throughout his book, that it's not micro-history or a collection of micro-histories, because these different ethnic, national, 
um, communities in the Ottoman Empire themselves are divided, have different expectations, agendas, power structures, geographic uh, distributions, and within each community, within each sub-public, there are many debates and many uh, issues to be negotiated. So, again, another question, what can we learn from this analysis of <clears throat> these various ethnic groups in this post-revolutionary period, which is very turbulent and uh, very, um, yeah, very turbulent uh, uh, period in Ottoman history and Middle Eastern history? Is there something that goes beyond these years and beyond this trajectory towards viol violence that we can uh, learn from this? <clears throat> and um, I'm keeping it short because we have a lot to discuss, of course. Uh, a phrase that you also mentioned now in your paper, uh, in your paper and also in the book, um, very often indeed, and it's very interesting, this uh, phrase, to think about it, is this unity in diversity. So what actually does this, um, this moment of unity in diversity mean for the revolution and for these various groups? That's my concluding remark already. Thank you very much. Do I have to leave now? Or have to ask? Um, if to you ask want to, <laughs> we can collect too. Okay. Very minor questions, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, if I understand, the, the first one was the what are the lessons of the Young Turks in the general framework of the Middle East? You play with it in your book, don't you? Okay, yeah, I'm just, just trying to understand what you're saying. Actually, we, we, can, uh, we can argue that the Young Turk Revolution was the last attempt uh, by the Ottoman Empire to preserve the territorial in integ integrity of the Ottoman Empire. It was the last attempt to put together, keep to get together the different ethnic groups in the empire. But there is a major problem with that because of the dominant dominance that the CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress, uh, enters into the political sphere and they become, eventually become uh, authoritarian regime, especially after 1913. Uh, of, co of course, the concept of nationalism is important too. It becomes endemic to the all, all the groups, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put the the uh, the uh, the nationalism as a major major uh, factor in the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire. I think it has to do with, it, it has to do more with the way in which the uh, leadership of the Ottoman of Com Committee of Union Progress handled the post-revolution period. It's a it, it's a contradiction of ideology. Uh, while the Young Turks believed in cen cen centralization, the others believe all most of the groups believed in ad administrative decentralization. Young Turks were Young Turks were uh, concerned that administrative decentralization was going to lead to the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire. I believe, I'm from the school that believes that until, until the Armenian genocide, the aim of the Ottoman, the aim of the Young Turk clique, Young Turk clique, whether Anwar Jamal or, or Talat Pasha, the, their aim was to preserve the integrity of the Ottoman Empire and not to dismantle it. And they pursued every means to preserve the integrity of the Ottoman Empire, if even it, it meant to uh, perpetrate a genocide. Uh, of course, the repercussion of the Young Turks have it has more repercussions of on on all the uh, uh, cities or the provinces that were part once part of the Ottoman Empire. And again, the idea I cannot I cannot say the imp what it led. You know, it just can explain the impact of the revolution. I, just, I cannot go and tell you. What was the impact in the during the British mandate period in Palestine, or, or you know, but if, think about it. If these mandates, if there wasn't World War One, maybe there wouldn't have been genocide even, you know. But that was an uh, opportunity, you know, good opportunity to solve the Armenian question one and for all. The second qu second question is what is the impact on what? I didn't understand that. What is the impact on what? No, like um, I wanted to ask you, and you also um, you partially, I think, answered in your book um, 
you know, how we view the Young Turk Revolution and its aftermath, you know, as a precedent, you know, for democratic processes or negotiating oh, Of course, of course. I mean, that's why the, that's why in the beginning the whole idea of uh, dreams was so important during the Young Turk Revolution. It's the first, the Young Turk Revolution opened the parliament. It's the first time that uh, elections, two-tier elections began it, it, it was on the way of a democratization process. The Middle East was the, it was the first democratization process in the Middle East following the Young Turk Revolution. Of course, there was the first parliament also opened uh, in the modern system in the Middle East post 20th century. But also the problem had to do with, the, with who, who was in the parliament. Armenians had 12 representatives, Jews had four, four or six, four I think, and uh, Greeks had but 32. But the majority of the parliamentarians were CUP members. <coughs> and most of the Arabs who run for the elections, they were CUP members too. They were backed by the CUP. So you, here you have created a major, majority in the parliament that began to take the, uh, be, be, that became the uh, ruling elite, let's say, from, from the parliament. So the parliament did not work as it should have been worked due to the majority of the, of the CUP. And the whole idea of a progressive political system started to collapsing. At the same time, the, you know, the Adana massacres took place in 1909. That's the subject of my second book. Uh, that really shakes the whole idea uh, uh, from the perspective of the CUP that We've given enough freedom, we've given a lot of freedom to these ethnic groups, and it's a time to rule the, 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 the empire with the, with, with, the, with the heavy hand, you know? And during the Balkan War, and here we have Janal, Eyal Jinoe, who wrote an excellent book about the Balkan Wars. During the Balkan Wars, when the CUP saw that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the existing authorities are not running the country in a, in a good way, they uh, they initiated a coup d'etat, and since then, since then, Ottoman Empire war, was ruled in an authoritarian uh, manner. So uh, I argue towards the end. There's a slide as to what were the main points of the book. Uh, one of the main points is the contradiction of the uh, of the ideals of the revolution, what the Armenians, Arabs wanted, and what the Young Turks wanted. The other is the uh, the other has to do with the decentralization and centralization clash within the Ottoman Empire, and the other has to do also the way in which the Young Turks pursued extra-legal and extra-constitutional, extra-legal and extra-constitutional measures in order to preserve its power, and preserving that power entailed a lot of things, assassinations, uh, clamping down on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the press, on dissidents, and eventually Ottoman Empire became a dictatorship towards the World War I. So here the dream, the dream that people had, even Ottomans, even the Sabah din people, even the Turkish liberals had about ruling, having a multi-dimensional empire where democratic system was going to work, did not work because even prior to the revolution, there, was, there were a lot of ambiguities and contradictions as to how the political system was going to work in the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Three. The third is, what can we learn from? I think what, what, what we can learn from all of this is that I've become a bit pessimist regarding revolutions in, in, in itself. I believe more in transitional, in uh, gradual transformation rather, rather than revolutions. Of course, sometimes, sometimes revolution works, but we see across the history that revolutions become very violent. And uh, the result of the revolution and the changes in dynamics of power within society might be very problematic. Uh, all revolutions have euphoric period. All of them are happy to initiate the revolution. The Arab Spring, take Cairo, for example. There's a lot of similarities between the Young Turk Revolution and, and, and Cairo and the, and the Arab Spring within uh, Egyptian revolution. Everyone is happy. Everyone believes in the beginning of new brotherhood. In Cairo, in Tahrir Square, in the Anglican Church, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the important imams comes, come 
and they all rise on, on to, onto the altar. They hug each other, Muslims and Christians, saying this is the beginning, this is a new beginning. And what do they do? They initiate democratic elections and the, uh, and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood comes into power, democratically, by the way. And eventually, the army intervenes and the whole revolution collapses. So the main point is here is that it's not about the revolution. Revolution takes place sometimes even without any preparation. It's a, it's a process. But the main point is that it's a litmus test after the revolution, how the political parties are going to interact, how the different political forces are going to understand each other. And usually this contradiction that takes place after the revolution is the main problem. In the Iranian Revolution of 1979, it wasn't moved, it wasn't planned by the mullahs. It, was, uh, con it had conglomeration of different groups, the Tudeh party, uh, the leftist party, the intellectuals, but eventually it, the balance went to the, uh, went to the, uh, 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 the uh, Islamic clergy, clerics, Islamic clerics. So the whole, whole idea of the uh, Young Turk Revolution, it began as a, as a novel idea where all the different political parties are going to cooperate together to get rid of the Shah. Eventually, it led to the, it led to, uh, it led to uh, the rise of a non-democratic entity of an authoritarian regime. If you want to, if you want to, you know, if you want to call that. So again, it's not a revolution. It's the post-revolution period that's the most critical period to understand the progression of the political system. And if you think about what happened after the Young Turk Revolution, you see the political progression, you would see that eventually the Young Turk feel that they needed the power in their hand because they thought that they were the ones who are the gate gatekeepers of the Ottoman Empire, the gatekeepers of the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire, and hence they did not want to give away any privileges or any power to other ethnic groups and eventually become an authoritarian regime, despite the fact that different ethnic groups tried to show their loyalty in, uh, the, during times of crisis, crises, but it didn't work. So that's uh, last but not least is university or university, uh, unity in diversity. The whole question is that is unity in diversity a possibility? You know, unity in diversity is a possibility. When the Young Turks were, were writing about in the, in the exile prior to the revolution, you know, they had a lot of communications with the Armenians, with the Greeks, and other groups. And they would bring one example about the way in which unity and diversity could work for the empire. And that's the case of the United States of America, where it's, it's a composition of different groups, different ethnic groups, but they are part of the larger federal system. And But then the question is that would would something a la American style work in the case of the Ottoman Empire? Here's the problem. The Young Turks, they wanted to have everything in their hand. They wanted to, uh, they wanted, uh, co uh, they, uh, they wanted mandatory teaching of Turkish language, Ottoman Turkish lang language to all the schools in the Ottoman Empire, regards Christian, Jews, etc. And they wanted to get rid of the privileges that the ethnic, religious ethnic groups had and enjoyed for many centuries, specifically the, uh, the schools that were run by the Patriarchate and the Hakan Bashlik and etc. So this was one of the contradictions because there are two ways of viewing, actually, the unity and the diversity thing. On the, on the one hand, the, uh, the unity that the Ottoman Empire was thinking about, it was, uh, it was more a Turkification process from the perspective of the others. Whereas the young Turks would say, this is not the Turkification process. What we're having is a process of uh, administrative reform. By administrative reform, we say that they got rid of everyone from the ancien regime, Arabs, good, good, good valleys, good mutasarrafs, and they put in their place loyal people to the CUP. So you are the party and you are controlling the country now. From the perspective of the others, this, uh, this is a Turkification process because we had enjoyed all these privileges for many years and we had the schools, we had our language, we were not going to be under the, under, be, under the inspection of the Ministry of Education. We can run our own schools. So these are the major clashes between the two ideas of unity and diversity. 
But again, could unity and diversity have worked in the case of uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, without, without having all of these political uh, ambitions of the young church, but also the ambitions of the, of the non-dominant groups in terms of keeping their privileges and, and uh, loyalty? So I hope I answered that. No, maybe I didn't answer it. But <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your great lecture and your uh, response and discussion. We're going to open the floor for questions now. And uh, if you could introduce yourself when you're asking your question, and uh, if you keep the questions uh, pretty short, that will be great. So the floor is now open to questions. Hi, uh, my name is Ivan Balslev. I'm a Polonsky Fellow here uh, at the Van Leer University. And, um, I study Iranian history, mm -hmm. so pretty much the same uh, time period, though. Um, and I have three questions, but two of them are relatively short, so I will ask all three. Um, and the first two are about the ceremonies <laughs> and the celebrations, that I think it's a very interesting um, perspective to look at. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask were, is, were these types of celebration uh, new, or did they resemble things that people knew before? Uh, did, it, did, it ma did it resemble anything that was there, that was uh, uh, pre-modern, or anything else? The other thing about the celebration is about the gardens. Um, you said that gardens have no memory, um, but I was wondering about it because I don't know if parks and gardens. Um, I know. I think in Iran it's like it's a relatively uh, modern thing having like a public park. So I think it does have different types, maybe of of memories or of uh, political connotation. Um, parks and gardens. And the third and maybe a bit uh, bigger question is when we speak about these types of um, of uh, revolutions and I wanted to ask about the inclusion how inclusionary and exclusionary are they because we all uh, we know that you know women naturally are excluded you know women are not part of the of the brotherhood of the fraternity in most revolutions in these times they are not granted political rights but also a thing that i noticed about iran and i wanted to ask you if the, it was the same thing in in the ottoman empire is the exclusion of the poor and that uneducated from political <coughs> um, from political participation usually by um, uh, by not giving them the right to vote, by having um, property qualifications for uh, voting. Property qualification and sometimes also not having the right to be elected uh, due to language barriers. Like they have to, in Iran it was, they have to know how to read and write in Persian, for example. Just if you remind me, what was the first one? The for, uh, about if the celebrations were new or was oh, it something... Yeah. Do you want to collect questions or do you want to answer them? What? Do you want to collect the questions or do you want no, to? No, I'll answer now because okay. of course. Regarding the, if the, these celebrations were new, I mean, we have different religious celebrations taking place in the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the Maulid al Nawawi, for example, and the uh, different phases in sultans, you know, uh, uh, processions and the, you know. But the, I, as far as I know, the uh, revolutionary festivities, festivities are new. Are new because people are aware. Most of the activists were outside, outside uh, Turkey, as of the Ottoman Empire. They were what I called in the exilic public sphere, uh, heavily influenced by uh, heavily influenced by European trends and ideas, social Darwinism, positivism, and eventually they were very well aware about the symbolism of the French Revolution. Because what you see, it's a copy of European, it's a copy of European festivities, you know, with its local exigencies, you know, having a fervor of, of an Ottoman Turkish fervor, but also ethnic fervor from different uh, groups. For example, I didn't mention here uh, the uh, the Jews in the during the festivities in Jerusalem. Here, the Jews were carrying banners with the uh, sign of Zion on it, 
and uh, also Torah. They were car carrying Torah. So this is not about this is not about Ottoman. It's about diver it's diversity. You know, that's the paragraph of diversity, the unity, which would have worked very well from the non-dominant perspective, but not from the perspective of the CUP. This is one. Parks and gardens. I mean, in the Ottoman case, uh, it's a it's a different than Iran. It seems because. Parks and gardens. It's uh, you know I I think it's 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 devoid of uh, memory in a sense of church or or cemeteries. You know it's uh, and you know it's the garden is has it's a new memory. It's a new celebration. But the decorator is nature. The decorator is the nature. So m most of the things I've read I've read actually gardens were not decorated. And why if, why they weren't decorated because. It's the nature is the decorator, and it's the beginning of the entrance into the new era. Okay. And regarding inclusion, in, in, inclusion, exclusion of women, you said. Uh, more, I'm more interested in in the poor. Oh, in the poor. Of course, you're definitely right because everyone who was supposed to vote had to have show that they own lands. You know. And the and the election wasn't direct election. It was a tier two tier election. So basically, everyone is going to uh, everyone was going to vote uh, to elect the notables of a certain city. And these intikhabi thani, they say, and these uh, notables are going to specifically select the members of the parliament. Okay, uh, women are not there, of course. I gave a talk uh, in uh, in Southern California about this to topic, and someone asked an important question, is what are the women in your research? Again, one thing that you, if you saw in the Erzurum uh, procession, the woman was on the carriage. But this brings me again to the, uh, to the idea of the French Revolution. In the aspect of French Revolution, you don't have political figures running the French Revolution. They're all, or they are, their their places in symbolism. They are represented in symbolic, uh, symbolic uh, fashion. The only person who dared to raise her head was Marie Gouge, Marie Gouge, Marie Gouge, Marie Gouge, Marie Gouge, who wrote the Declaration of Women's Rights, and and she was executed for that. So again, this is a patriarchal society, and its political culture is uh, patriarchal. There wasn't in, in, in even any single member of parliament that was a woman. Regarding the exclusion of poor and uneducated, definitely right. There was th there was this process of uneducated, but also you had, for example, members of the parliament who were sitting in the parliament. They didn't know how to speak in Ottoman even. They didn't have the oratory skills. And the, you would see that the Arab in the Arab press they would be cr cr they were going to or they were under heavy criticisms, saying that. You know, Armenians are, uh, you know, uh, well orators, even there are 10 people. We are 60 people from the Arab provinces, and we don't have good portion of uh, members of parliament who can even talk in Turkey, or even talk Ottoman, you know, let alone be able to express their, 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 them, themselves or even, you know, uh, present, the, uh, present the problems of their own provinces. So I hope this was... Any more questions? Yeah. Hey, thank you for the very enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, racism. Can you introduce yourself shortly? Yes, thank you. sorry. Omar uh, Eilat, Tel Aviv University. Oh, you're Ormil. So, I would like to ask about the dimension of racism uh, within uh, the repercussions of of the revolution, because uh, it is it exists in, in the it exists in the discourse, and specifically, I work on on uh, on the Arab provinces and and the discourse regarding the Tatric. <coughs> is, uh, it was uh, quite developed around here, so. Um, do you see racism? I mean, do you see it as this as something um, which is a, 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 some work premise 
in the in the war in the uh, processes led by the center or something that some group groups uh, parts of the CUP perhaps uh, would like to to promote directly by, by racism you mean f uh, racism from the perspective of the perspective of the uh, government towards the other groups or racism from the groups to the government F but uh, comparing uh, uh, Turks in the center, I mean, is it is it Turks versus minorities, ethnic minorities and re religious minorities, or center um, or tension between center and, and periphery? Where uh, while uh, the problem with center versus periphery would not be a huge problem, I think, due to the fact that most of the most of the uh, governors and the sub-governors have also have already been appointed by the CUP. So they're taking direct orders from the CUP. Of course, you have other sections that uh, CUP members weren't part, very, very, very small uh, percentage, they weren't part of the CUP, such as the, in the case of Adana. But what you've created is a, is a huge wave of disgruntled elements that belong to the ancien regime that hate the CUP now and they want to really uh, bash the CUP and that they try to do, do, to do so during the counter-revolution. So the idea from center to periphery is uh, the CUP was a bit concerned as to, as to the, uh, about the uh, shaky situation of some of the provinces, you know, specifically after the counter-revolution. But in terms, of the, in terms of the Young Turks and the other groups, of course, during the, even during the post-revolution period, specifically before, prior to the elections, you have the concept of Milleti uh, Hakime, the ruling elite, ruling nation, which is the Ottoman Turkish Muslim nation. And uh, most of the groups have become very, very angry about raising the concept of Milati Hakime. Okay, and it's uh, even in the Armenian pre press, they say, you know they say there are, there are uh, writings that you would even hear during the 50s or 60s, Turkey for Turks. They would hear that among Jews and Armenians in Turkey in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, Turks for the Turks, Turkey for the Turks, and that's the Turkey for the Turks. You would read it in 1908. And the idea of Millat uh, Hakime uh, uh, was raised by his, uh, uh, Hussein Jahid, who was the editor of uh, uh, editor of Tanin, the major mouthpiece of the CUP. And because of his uh, position, it really made a huge effect on all the other uh, all the other ethnic groups. But again, from the center, they want they say this is administrative. Uh, this is bureaucratic reform, bureaucratic reform. The others see it as Turkification process. And again, as I said, after the litmus test, the real, after the uh, euphoria, the real litmus test of the political progression pro process would start. And you would see the real difficulties there, even within the parliament, about these issues to become very pessimistic, you know. And so, yeah, I think that racism played the dominant role too in that case from the Young Turks perspective, the way that they viewed the others, the way that they viewed the, uh, the non-dominant groups, the Jews, the Arabs, uh, specifically the Albanians, the only Muslim nation who is going to rise against the Turks are the Albanians in uh, 1912 or 1910 or 12. So, yeah. Um, any more? Okay. Ilan Rees from the Central Bureau of Statistics. I'm studying migrations. My question is about, first of all, uh, it works? Now it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. better? Oh, yes. I want to ask about the role of the Donmeo group in the revolution and in uh, all this uh, picture about the ethnic groups. And the second question is about the Jews and Armenian relationship, because uh, Jews were blamed for the <coughs> Armenian genocide, especially the Alexander Gelfand Parvus, the Russian revolutionary, 
from the Jewish descent that has a special role in uh, the <laughs> revolution in these years. And he was also blamed for the Armenian genocide. So maybe you can explain a bit about this special groups, Don Mio and the Jews. <coughs> well, I'm not aware about the Don Mio that much. I know they used to be converted group uh, to uh, from Judaism to Islam. Uh, but the way that Don Mio is used, it's very in a very derogatory term, specifically in the, in the case of the Young Turks, trying to and it's an anti-Semitic move, actually, trying to show that the leaders who committed the crimes were originally, especially Talat, was originally Dunma, Dunma Jew, you know, which doesn't make sense, you know, in that perspective. But the Dunma did not play a, a, lo a huge role in the revolution. It was uh, symbolic. The Jews pr pr played some role, as a matter of fact. None of the groups actually played, uh, played an important role in the process of the revolution. But in the post-revolution period, because all of them are non-dominant groups, they have to prove their loyalty to the center. They have to be. They have to show their allegiance to the new uh, political order. Order, and to do so, it was it was through the uh, festivities that they showed that uh, illegitimacy. Regarding the Jews, I'm not aware. I have I've been reading for many years about the Armenian genocide. Do research about the Armenian genocide. I'm not aware about the Jews being involved in the Armenian genocide. Maybe in the massacres. Uh, of the 1909, the, the or the but in the process of uh, ideological. Uh, the no, I'm not aware of. I, I would say that Circassians did play a role, uh, but not the Druze. So. Uh, thank you very much. We'll take one last question. Over here. My, na my name is Nicole Zurkes. I work in tourism. In one of the pictures you showed, there were green flags and red flags. Was there ever a discussion to have in Turkey a green flag? Well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not aware about that green flag. Because in Egypt, they carry green flag too. Yes, I know, but yeah. you, you had one of the, picture, one of I the know, postcards. I know, I know. Okay. Maybe it's a religious flag versus national flag. I don't know, you know, because green is the color of Islam too. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. We'll close the session. <laughs>